Welcome to Small Town Tales, a podcast where we hear stories of the paranormal, haunting legends, and all things spirit. Join us as we explore the unknown. Now, here's your host, C.L. Thomas. Welcome to Small Town Tales podcast. I'm your host, C.L. Thomas. Tonight's guest is David Hero Aberly. He joins us to speak about indigenous history and Native American interactions with the paranormal. Tonight, we're going to discuss different types of spirits that he comes in contact with on and off camera, what he does to fight these spirits if they're evil, and how to bring balance back to the locations and the people who come to him for help. Before we start, I just want to brag a little bit on Hero and how impressed I am with him. Uh, Hero is the leader and medicinal practitioner of unearthing the supernatural the first Native American group of paranormal investigators that utilize agent teachings and techniques combined with modern technology to make contact with beings of the other side. He is ordained in the traditional ceremonies to speak and interact with beings of all realms. This is so interesting. He says that he brings to the group unearthing the supernatural over 20 years of traditional Native American experiences with influences from many tribes. This is so impressive because Hero is a very young man, and he's just so impressive. He is an author of his work, Journeys of a Young Spirit Abalone, and has been part of several national television appearances on shows like Ghost Avengers, NBC Peacock's Unidentified with Demi Lovato. I have to say, I'm just so impressed with Hero. I'm excited to have him on and happy to talk about what he brings to the paranormal. Hero, thank you for being a part of the show. Yeah, definitely. So, um... I'm a medicinal person from the Diné Navajo tribe, and uh, my particular role and kind of my upbringing has really brought me to a very interesting point in uh, my life and my teachings to where now um, I have a ceremony that helps out with uh, with spirits and beings of the other side and also dealing kind of with the negative uh, entities that are out there. And it was in a ceremony that was kind of going extinct. And so uh, with how I was raised and, and the ceremonies I was taught, we're going to do everything we can to keep these ceremonies going. And uh, a few years ago, my brother actually had the idea. He's like, hey, you go out, you help these people out with the with the spirits. You go and uh, help these uh, the land out. You go to these sacred sites. And we have amazing uh, adventures. We have amazing um, interactions. Why don't we kind of go to some haunted locations and uh, just, Camera, cameras with us, take some equipment with us, and let's see what we can do about about um, finding out what's going on and how we can interact with these spirits. And since we started doing that, it's just been taking off like crazy, and people are really enjoying the content. We love bringing the indigenous Native American aspect to paranormal investigating, and we'd like to show some of uh, our techniques and techniques that have been handed down to us for thousands and thousands of years of interacting with uh, spiritual entities. So it seems like the, the Native Americans are kind of um, reluctant to to even talk about a lot of the paranormal. Is, is that true? Very much so, yes. Why is that? Yeah, very much so. Um, the main reasons are is we there's a lot of taboos and a lot of different traditions and tribes that you don't go messing around with things that you don't completely understand. And only select people that know the songs, ceremonies, and protections are supposed to be the ones going out to deal with these things. If you don't have that, if you don't have those protections or that knowledge, they say you can get hurt. They say you can uh, you can get sick, and it throws you out of balance, and it's almost like a, a major disrespect to those spirits if you don't know how to address them properly. So that's where most tribes and most people are just taught to stay away from all that stuff leave it alone. If you're being afflict- afflicted by it, contact someone like a medicinal person, someone of the tribe that knows the songs and ceremonies to deal with it. So with that, uh, you also have the element of the uh, boarding schools, the assimilation, everything that has happened previously to where our tra- our traditional beliefs, our cultural life ways, our ancestral heritage was taken away from us and it was actually punished. We were killed, um, the mass genocides that happened, as well as the, the huge popular phrase, kill the Indian, save the man. It was up until 1977, 1978, 
when we were actually able to actually perform our ceremonies legally. Uh, other than that, we could get incarcerated. There are stories of, um, of even my elders being uh, burnt in the Hogans and uh, the teepees and chased out and thrown into prison for just practicing our simple cultural beliefs. And so there's a lot of cultural scarring that's still there. And even to this day, there's people that like to do cultural appropriation and kind of misrepresenting the indigenous aspects of who we are and how we interact with the spiritual worlds. And so with all this hardship, with all this scarring and with even the loss of a lot of ceremonies, a lot of our elders are passing. We want to, as another thing the supernatural, give what information we can. We're definitely going to hold a lot of the sacred teachings to ourselves. We keep that kind of beyond the camera. We know we can utilize them for whatever monetary gains they want. We protect our sacred knowledge, but we also want to share what we can because Everyone's here on Turtle Island of all races. It's a melting pot. There's a lot of people here. And before settlers came, before this land was really, um, the worlds kind of came to the, this land here, there was indigenous spirits that were around, and us indigenous people were caretakers to that. We were the ones that would do offerings. We were the ones that would um, pretty much take care of the land and keep things in balance as best as we could. And when the... Uh, Settlers came over and really wiped us out with sickness, with war and genocide. All of that kind of went out, out of balance. And now we're at a point in time where we're like, okay, what can we do to help? What can we do to not only help the people understand, but kind of bring that balance back to the spiritual world, bring balance back to these spirits to where maybe people can acknowledge them. People can give them simple offerings, or at least people have an avenue to go to know where to go to if something's happening on indigenous lands. So you yourself are a medicinal practitioner. Um, can you talk about your journey and see how you became that? Yeah. So when I was a young boy, I was kind of uh, always raised. My mom and dad always took me to traditional ceremonies, and I was always part of it. And um, the songs, the teachings, the ceremonies were always there in my family growing up. When I was younger, uh, I was told that I was starting to get, have some signs of uh, some sort of gift developing. And as a young kid, I didn't really quite understand that too much. But as I grew older, I started to see more things that other people couldn't, feel things, um, have dreams. A lot of different things started to develop that I couldn't really quite explain um, the only ones I could really talk to were other medicinal people or uh, people who, who know of the songs and ceremonies and how that path goes. And when I was 13 years old, I was selected to be part of, um, and I guess in English translate out to like a guardianship um, cultural exchange program. And basically what it is, it's a, it's a high council that selects youth from many different tribes and they bring us together and we kind of share knowledge. We share songs and ceremonies in an effort to keep these old ceremonies alive. And for the Diné people, I'm considered the Western guardian. So the San Francisco peaks, the Goat Sleep, that's uh, the mountain that I um, have to learn that I or have learned, learned all the songs and ceremonies about it and all the philosophies behind it. And with that mountain also comes war and dealing with kind of the darker side and how to confront that. And so there's a lot of teachings that go behind all that. But I guess since I was 13, I was selected to be part of that. And the whole journey was an amazing journey. A lot of different things happened. Um, a lot of uh, hardship, a lot of struggle. And, um, but the journey itself is beautiful. And to where now I'm 29 years old, been doing this for quite some time. And now I'm starting to teach the youth. I'm starting to teach the next generation of guardians to kind of go forward and be able to keep balance in the world that we have today. That's really cool. What is some of the indigenous history and in Native Americans' interactions with the paranormal? So with the interactions that indigenous people have had, it's it's just like how the interactions that like you and I have or how if you meet someone at a grocery store, it's literal everyday life for us. It's a way of life. It's not a religious belief or religious practice. It's an actual everyday way of life, how we interact with the world of spirit, how we are always singing. We are always doing offering. We are always watching how we 
how we move, how we act, how we talk to each other. Um, and they say, Every breath that you, that you have, every word that you speak is a prayer. Every thought you have is a prayer. Your hair itself is a culmination of your thoughts. And all that dives in the realm of the paranormal, dives in the realm of the supernatural. We honor the, those deities that kind of take care of us and help that shape the world that we have today. And we interacted with these spirits on a daily basis. We interacted with nature and all the spirits of nature. And then there are times when we have to interact with the things that are not so good. And so we try our best to live a world in balance. And But there are some things out there that try to get us off that balance, that try to kind of push us off our path. And that's where the medicinal people, that's where the people who have the sacred knowledge, the warriors to come in and kind of push that darkness back. And that usually entails song, ceremony, or directly, physically interacting with these spiritual entities or these spiritual energies. So it was an everyday thing for, for all of us. It's a way of life. And there was, a, to us, historically, there was no difference between a person to a person or a person to a spirit. It was just like breathing. It was a part of our lives every day. You have a unique approach to investigating and interacting with the paranormal world. Can you talk a little bit about how you go in as an investigator on some of the investigations that you do? Yeah. Um, how I go in when we investigate. First off, we uh, whether we go in blind or we do a little research before going into a location, what we do is we get a feel for the area. What we have learned, um, normally you'll see us, like you'll see some of our, our website or you see us when we're on our on film or whatever, you'll see us with our armor, our swords, our protections, our herbs, our, that's awful dressed to the nines protection. And we've learned that that's not really the best way to go about interacting with spirits. So when we go into a location, what we'll do is we'll go in just as a human, and we try not to use our real names, hence why my uh, you see Hero, my brother is Sean Clan, and you see all the other groups has some very specific special names. We tell each other we're not going to use our real names in person because that's also an investigative tool to see how powerful the spirits are at the location if they can determine our names, uh, one level, and if they can even determine our beyond spiritual names. I have a, another name that I go by, and when I do ceremony, if they can recognize that name, that kind of tells a little bit about their power level. But when we go into an investigation, we go in with the utmost respect. We go in as if we're going to someone's home. We always knock. We always uh, say hello. Uh, we let them know why we're there. We let them know what's going on. And we just tell them, this is an opportunity for you to tell your story. There's a lot of people that want to just go out and capture ghosts. They just want to go out for the thrill and they want to just, or they'll take off screaming and running once mm -hmm. uh, the spirits actually make themselves known. But to us, it's like, oh, yeah, eh. like you're going to a family member's home or, or even a stranger's home and you have that utmost respect. And it's like, this is why we're here. We're here to tell your story. We're here if uh, you need offering or if you need blessings, um, if someone needs help. Uh, or if the homeowner needs help, something's going on with the homeowner, you let them know what's going on and you really start developing that communication. You get that true communication. You have to have that from your heart. You have, your intent has to be there. It can't be, oh, I'm here to make money or I'm here to capture a full body apparition. And then if I get that, I'm good. I'm, I'm leaving. No, it's like, here, you can read me spirits, uh, beings of this, of this location, of this place. You can read me and see that this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to help you more so than we are ourselves. We have these equipment. We have these things. So that way it's a means for you to tell your story. And it's also a means of acknowledgement to show that you are here. And with you being here, there's going to people going to have a level of respect for you being here. And so you kind of, you have that level of respect. You have that level of communication. And we go at it methodically like a ceremony. There's steps to it. There's very uh, particular motions. There's even songs and prayers that we do while we're investigating. And um, this particular language I use is actually an old spiritual language that um, they say when someone passes on, even the ghost of the spirits, they learn this language on their journey to the other side. And so it's been really interesting when we um, have the SB7 spirit box going on 
and I'm speaking the spiritual language and they respond in that spiritual language, whether they're Native American or not. That goes to show that there is some language learning that is there with this very sacred holy language that is spoken. Yeah. So it's it's a very fun ride. Um, it's very interesting. We're still learning a lot, kind of going into it. But we try to blend the technology that we have with our traditional teachings and uh, traditional viewpoints and see what amazing things that we can uh, discover and interact with, with those particular combinations. And using that blend of agent wisdom with current technology, that really sets you apart from a lot of these other paranormal groups out there right now. It's really interesting. Definitely. And definitely it's, it's interesting because, um, like you said, indigenous people aren't really ones to go out with these things. And like I always said earlier, too, this particular ceremony that I was taught was going extinct. And so there isn't anyone alive today that would normally go out to interact with these spirits. Way long time ago, there would be people that would be able to keep the balance and interact with beings like this. So it is very unique, is very interesting, and something that we enjoy sharing with people and then um, expressing ourselves having the spirits express themselves, and it's just an overall beautiful environment. This might be somewhat of a silly question, but is it the same spirits from, let's say, a thousand years ago that they're still roaming and talking to modern-day humans? Yeah. So what's interesting about that is there, there's a whole blend of different spirits from even beyond what human thought can kind of comprehend about the multitude of different types of spirits, multitudes of different types of energies, wavelengths, frequencies, there's all kinds of different beings that are out there. Beings from thousands of years ago, even before, they, we say even before this land was created and shaped to what it was, there are beings, ancient beings around that uh, still tend to their sacred sites, that still tend to the prayers, and still do what they were meant, uh, kind of created to do. And then you also have the blend of spirits of more modern day, the spirits maybe who have passed on in the past few hundred years, all the way up to someone who's passed away a few hours ago. There are ways of interacting with spirits and beings. And that's where I think that ancient language that we speak, and that I'm blessed to have learned and am still working with as well, I'm thankful for that because that allows me to speak to those beings that may not know English, that may not know our modern dialect or what we're saying. But what's interesting, too, what we found, is even if they are an old being or if they're being hundreds of years old, they still look, they still listen, they still see the world similar to how we see it. There's little differences, but they see it how we see it. So they learn to pick up on languages. They learn to pick up on habits. They kind of see things, too. They see the world events happening. And who, who's to say that if, if any of us were to pass away and there's a new language that's spoken in the land and you see someone speaking it, as a spirit, you might take it on yourself to try to learn that language as much as you can as well. I have been on some investigations recently. I've just moved to Las Vegas from Nashville um, about almost two years now. And two of the investigations that I've been on in the area, one was in Arizona and the other in Southern California. And both times I felt like the spirits there don't know English. So it was very difficult to try to communicate with them. Um, Definitely. What are some of the spirits that you meet on and off camera? That, uh, that we meet? Yeah, like... Are they human? Are they elementals? How do you decipher the difference? And what are some of the spirits that you've dealt with over the years? Oh, there's been a ton of spirits over the years that we've dealt with. Um, some, uh, I'm still trying to figure out the right English words to how to describe them. <laughs> but there are beings um, that how we see as ghosts, how some people call elementals. Uh, in our traditional beliefs, we have spirits and beings that are of, I guess, similar to elementals, but they're of the earth, they're of the sky, they're of like the thunder world, the beings of the fire, the beings um, that are in the stones and the sacred sites, the water. There's different worlds and realms, even the mirror realms, um, beings, uh, some beings that we've uh, encountered on our episodes are just normal ghosts from back hundreds of, hundreds of years ago, all the way up to ancient beings all the way up to even our most recent episode dealing with uh, a Thunderbird. 
And so the sighting of a Thunderbird, that was amazing to have even the famous John Zaffis witness seeing the Thunderbird and hear the call of the Thunderbird that we actually caught on SB7. Um, ancient, ancient beings like that, that are not human, that are of a of monstrous ancestry. And, um, but like the phantoms, which are both neither good nor, uh, nor bad, uh, death spirits, beings of, um, of the demonic nature, those are very rare, but we've come across a couple of those um, uh, beings that claim to kind of come from hell and come from the darker realms of things. But man, there's so much uh, on, on the list that you can, we can try to describe of the beings we've interacted with, but it's, it's, an, it's amazing, honestly. Has there been any that really stand out to you? Like any case or any spirit that you dealt with that has been life-changing in some way? Um, I would say that Thunder Being has caused a lot of stir and a lot of uh, movement in the indigenous com communities, especially in the higher medicinal people. Um, the Thunderbird, at least in our particular area, there, there, there are tales of it being a good being, but in our particular area, the Thunderbird was seen as a being, uh, a monstrous being that was said to have been put away a long time ago by our, by our monster slayers. And with its spirit being sighted, not only being sighted by non-Indigenous people, but also being caught on our electronic devices and it crying out and its effects of its cry actually chasing the ghosts and spirits of the location we we're investigating, chase them away. And they were saying they were being hunted. They were scared. That particular sighting really kind of shook up the indigenous community as well because that's society oh, there's an old prophecy that someday these monsters that were put away are going to come back and are going to wreak havoc again and we have to learn these old songs and ceremonies like the monster slayers before did and be able to put them away again but um other than that uh the demonic cases we faced were really intense especially for the, our other crew members who aren't as experienced as i am who are learning the path, who are learning the songs and ceremonies, they were extremely affected by these, these entities. But it was a good learning experience as well to how to deal with the dark side, how to kind of find that inner strength within yourself to be able to push through it and, in a sense, not really dance with them, but in a sense to be in their presence and still get out of battle alive, like counting coup in the old days where you go up to the enemy and if you can touch the enemy and cut and, and retreat without being killed, then that's uh, a sign of uh, honor. So I was on a case recently, and it was in Southern California, and the family living there has owned the property since 1912. And she says that when they built the house in the, I think, 1970s, it's, it's about a 1,000 acres of farmland that was taken from the Native Americans that lived there. And the house that she built they found bones and stuff. Um, she thought originally that it might, the cemetery was around her house, but when you look at the layout of the land from back then, it was all rolling hills and they had flattened the entire area. So it may have come from, who knows, 10 miles down the road, you know? But what we found at this location um, was that the fields are haunted. We were seeing shadows, we were seeing lights, it's very negative around the house, but the house itself are all hauntings that she cut a homeowner herself brought in. Um, do you think that when land was taken from Native Americans that they had called elemental type spirits to kind of reside on the land and haunt the people who have taken it over? Like, what do you think about that? There, there could be several things that that go go with that honestly because you you it all depends on the particular person's mindset and attitude to how they built the house and what they did with the bones um if it was by pure accident to where like oh my gosh i didn't know this was here and the house was already constructed then that's really not in their control but if there were bones when they were laying the foundation and when they were and they found the bones and they still said continue to build, I don't care, build, or I don't believe in that, just build, That those are two different complete scenarios that can cause, like we said, intent. The spirits will know your intent. Do you intend to cause disrespect and disregard, 
or was it by complete accident? And that will really tell you the type of uh, spiritual entities and possible hauntings. Both instances, you're going to have some form of spiritual connection, some form of spiritual haunting, because it you have bones there. You have, uh, even if it's nearby, a cemetery, a, a place where people did ceremonies and had a lot of grief. That were in the, Sometimes when someone passes, you go through stages of grief you go through that release of energy uh, for your loved one. And then you also have the ceremonies of the death spirits and the body that's put there. And there's a whole process to putting someone away and to desecrate that and to kind of uh, have your own intentions with the land that's there and disregard those beings. Then you're going to have spiritual connections. Those There's certain areas that are marked as burial grounds. And even as indigenous people long, long time ago before settlers, those were highly respected because those are going to those are final resting places. Even other tribes would respect other tribes burial sites. You have respect for that. Now, with a lot of things that are going on nowadays and a lot of construction, a lot of housing projects, a lot of things that are happening in disregard to these burial sites, the spirits are upset. The spirits are going to wreak havoc. The spirits are going to do what they can. And. What's interesting is they can be really like how you see in the movie, the poltergeist activity where they're very prominent and they're really telling you, get out. This is our land. Go. Or they can do what I like to call the slow death. And what that is, is slowly mishaps happen. Things start happening in the family. Um, you start losing children. Uh, uh, pregnant women lose children. Um, you start developing cancers. Uh, relationships don't work out. It's a slow, long, painful, uh, it's called the slow death, to where the spirits are like, you um, disregarded us. And so from here on, this is kind of the negative energy that you're going to absorb. This is karma going to slowly get at you. So with that, there's a lot of um, ceremonies that have to take place, uh, communication that has to take place. And there's also an understanding that even if that is your home that you built there, and if you didn't know that there was stuff there, you can interact with those spirits and say, hey, I'm sorry that I built this home here. Um, I'm going to choose to live here. I'm taking care of the land. Um, as long as I for, um, take care of the land and as long as I take care of my home, I'm going to do the best I can to take care of everything. Let's, let's live together. Let's cohabitate together. You can have your stuff where you're at. And I'm going to have my stuff where I'm at. And then we'll just take care of each other that way. There, there, there's ways to go about it. So this particular case, um, I believe you're called in on this one to kind of restore balance to the family owner. She's in her 70s now, and she's lost a few children. Um, she's on her third marriage, and she claims that the hauntings are causing all of this. She's lost two husbands, and now the third one, he's terminally ill. So it's it's a really heavy case. But definitely, how do you go about restoring balance to a place like this? That one, um, like I said, you have to, I'd have to go in first. <laughs> um, either me or someone has to go in first and really find out what's going on from the spiritual aspect. Because uh, what we've come to find out, when with all my years of dealing with patients or helping people of these very similar cases, sometimes the person, the patient, the person that you're, you're helping out, they're not 100% truthful, whether they know it or not. They can remember something and it happened a little bit differently. The spirits are the ones that will be able to tell you, this is why I'm pissed off. This is why this is happening. I see what's gone, gone on. She's not telling you everything or he's not telling you everything. Um, that's where I, I like to just resort, resort to the spirits and get multiple spirits' input. Because there are some cases where some spirits will lie too. But... You get the input from all parties, and then you try to uh, mediate. You try to be like, okay, what's going on here? Is there any way we can fix it? You talk to the spirits, and they'll let you know what you need to do to fix it, if there is fixing. If not, then they're, the most extreme cases is like, there's nothing you can do. You either deal with the slow death and the mishaps, or you leave. Um, there's really there's extreme cases like that, but for the most part, their spirits... They want to be acknowledged. They want to know that, hey, you're dancing all over my dead body, bro. Can you just get, not not do that and realize that I'm right here 
and maybe plant a flower for me or something and it will be cool. Sometimes it's just sim as simple as that, but it will have to take communicating with the spirits and it will have to get be take getting all sides of the story and then just really with truest intent, try to help out all parties in the situation. Do you feel like sometimes that Native Americans, um, particularly in the field of paranormal, it's people are so quick to blame Oh, it's, it's a Native American haunting. It's a curse from the Native Americans. Do you feel like that's a common mishap or belief from people? Uh, I think re uh, resorting to it right off the back is naive, um, is, is, is just kind of not really getting the full side of the story. But on the other side of that coin, there was a lot of stuff that happened to the indigenous people there was a lot of war that happened, a lot of genocide that happened, and all of this land that was here was indigenous land. So <laughs> there, there, there are uh, a lot of aspects that you could be indigenous hauntings or did, not necessarily curses. I've seen curses um, come about, and those, 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 those are there, but it's more, more along the lines of respecting the land that you're around and acknowledging the beings that are around so you have a town let's let's take let's take flagstaff arizona for example that's a town built at the base of a huge sacred mountain that has a lot of sacred stories to it but there are some people that live there some people that thrive there and for a lot of cases we try to say hey just respect the mountain that's there don't do anything to desecrate it snowball <laughs> but there, there, there's a whole history with that, but the with when it comes to kind of going about like, oh, it's a Native American curse, it's a Native American land, but like a sh like shooting a shotgun blast, you want to be kind of narrow that 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 vector a little bit to where you're like, okay, is it truly the Native Americans doing it? I'm sure they have a little bit of a hand in it, but is there something else? Is it the owner? Is it a mis ha mishap that happened here? Or is it something truly indigenous or even beyond older than Native Americans, something ancient? Have you ever been to the Bell Witch Cave? I talk about that place all the time. I drove by it and I was never able to go there. I've actually spent a night. Yeah, the time we went by there was actually during uh, during COVID. So they had it shut down, unfortunately. We were going to stop by and check it out, though. It's a, it's a really interesting place. And that's one that everybody says is a Native American haunting, but I kind of feel like it's everybody going there and investigating and creating that energy instead of it being like a Native curse. What's interesting about, I think, I, I've heard about that too, about the Bell Witch Cave. And like I said, I'd have to go in there to really get my own opinion, my own solid opinion on it. As far as, well, you brought up a good point with a lot of people kind of bringing a hype to a location or kind of bringing, giving it acknowledgments, whatever is there, whatever spirit's there, if it's malicious or if it's not, or if it's just a regular spirit just taking care of its home, own home, whatever it is, these uh, really famous locations, these really active locations that everyone hears about, these spirits get fed with energy a lot. They get fed with either fear or they get fed with anticipation. Even thinking about it from long distance, you're having some sort of connection to it some sort of, of energy thought given to its existence. And from there, it gives some beings power, it gives some el elements, some, um, some power to, to move, maneuver and go about. And what's interesting is we can go to a location that's very haunted and very active and that has seen a lot of investigators come in. And those spirits know how to interact with like REM pods or SB7s, polter pods or whatever type of, ghost hunting device you have they seem to know how to work those but let's say if you were to go to a location that's not that has never been investigated before those spirits have never seen those devices you almost have to teach those spirits hey um here's a rem pod here let me tell you exactly what it is it's, this is a, assuming that they speak english but it some means of communication you kind of have to teach them a little bit so that's where us at unearthing supernatural we like going to both Un, un really undiscovered locations and also very active locations because those spirits they know how to use the tools and you just kind of got to know where you're at and adjust accordingly what do you do in investigations um 
with the, with the knowledge of the afterlife. Like we, we as investigators collected all this information. So what do you do with it? What's next? So with all that, uh, us as indigenous people, we carry on this knowledge from thousands of thousands of years of interacting with spirits. So to us, it's not really new knowledge as a whole. To me as a human being, I'm learning. I'm always going to be learning. Even beyond my time here on this earth, I'm going to continue learning. But I'm learning how it, it's a different story when you when you read something in a book or when you live it. When you watch a movie or you live it. It's a different feeling, different set of emotions, different set of senses that are put into it. So with us as Indigenous people, with our knowledge that we have, it's seeing it firsthand and bringing a new aspect, a new thought processes to it. And to us, when we investigate the, the paranormal, what we are doing is we are showing ancient knowledge and our interactions in a modern day. And we're also trying to step up the paranormal community, be like, okay, you can say you, you have evidence that there's spirits here, there's ghosts here. Now what? Do you know how to interact with them? Do you know how to give offering to them? Do you know how to allow them to tell their story instead of you telling your own story about them? Let them speak. Let them tell their story. That's where some shows are really scripted and they have a certain way about doing things. Some are shotgun. Us, we, we have a hard time. It's like, well, we'll just go with the steps of the ceremony how we normally do and let the spirits tell the story. It's up to them how they want to interact with us. So... That's the key thing is interaction. That's what's next in the paranormal community. Interaction, wholesome, respectful, uh, knowledge gathering, and just relearning ancient knowledge that we once had and how to incorporate it in a modern world. So you've been on ghost adventures at Vulture City, and I want to talk about this entity that you come across where you are mapping this tall entity, I think with a LIDAR, I believe. But it didn't really go into yeah. what this was. What was that entity? So uh, that entity um, in the episode, uh, before we, Ghost Adventures even got there, we well, it was actually one of our first investigations as a group to where we brought all our equipment and everything. We went to Vulture City. And when we went there, I was immediately struck with knowledge that there, this is a sacred site. The vulture peaks, the mountains in the area is a very sacred site. I didn't know quite what. So when we investigated the location, I asked the spirits, what's going on? What exactly makes this location sacred? And you you, you talk to it in the ceremonial sense. You use the spiritual teachings. You ask, like, what is this place? What's going on? And who is here? What kind of beings are here? Who am I going to talk to? And from there, it developed to where it was a burial ground for the monsters that we talked about earlier in, in the show, was that these beings were buried here. When they were killed off long, long ago, their bodies had to be placed somewhere and put, have protective shields put over them so that way the energy doesn't get the people sick anymore. So they buried a lot of the monsters at this location. Just so happens that energy suck, um, kind of came out a little bit and made itself shown in a quartz crystal to Henry Wickenburg. And he picked up that quartz crystal, and um, mineral mineralogists know that when there's quartz crystals around, there's a chance for gold. Hence, Henry Wickenburg went and established a gold mine in Vulture City. Vulture City established and grew, and a lot of greed came about it. They dug, they dug, they dug. And now even uh, it stopped after a while, and but... Here recently, they reopened the mines again, and they're digging deeper and deeper. Them digging deeper, they're actually getting into the chambers of where these beings were buried, and their energy is being released. So the ghosts of giants, monstrous beings, huge tall beings, yet eat so huge beings that will go around and eat people, their spirits are roaming around, hunting the spirits of those grounds. And so it's an interesting kind of connection we made when we did our investigation and we we found evidence of the giants yay yeah, so are you here in a two-story building and you can't get to the second story it's a huge vaulted vaulted assay building and you hear pounding on the roof you hear growling you hear the spirit saying the monsters the giants are out there 
And we made this into an episode, and Ghost Adventures happened to uh, someone recommended that episode of the Ghost Adventures, and they watched it. They asked us to go out there and do a ceremony and to, to tell them about it. And so we did. We did the ceremony, told them about the monsters and giants that we found. And it was awesome that they used uh, some brand new technology using a LiDAR uh, scanner similar to an XLR camera. It's a, um, they utilized that and they actually called the, caught the full body apparition of these giants roaming around the buildings and walking around wreaking havoc. And it's awesome because most people are used to just ghosts or demons. And that's about, about the gist of it. But we start introducing mm-hmm. the ancient stories, the stuff that we as indigenous people have been talking about for thousands of years. And you introduce that. And you're not only introducing the stories, but you're bringing realism to the stories by showing images of these spirits, of our stories, of these beings that are around. It brings validation to us as indigenous people and it brings validation to the spirits that are there like hey these things are here be careful well hero where do these spirits come from what are these monsters exactly and where do they come from so the old stories talk about how these monsters were actually at least in the Diné creation story the navajo creation story we came from worlds previous to this one we came from uh, this is the fourth world that we're in and you have the black world, the yellow world, the blue world, and finally this world, the glittering world. And when we came into this world, um, the first being that came into this world was Locust. So he came through because the third world, the blue world, was flooding. There was a huge flood. Water Coyote stole Water Monster's babies, and it was flooding the world. So they escaped through um, a bamboo reed. And Locust was the first one to come out. And when he came out, he was looking around the land, and he he said that there was monstrous beings, huge monstrous beings of different types. Some were winged, some were horned, some were giants, walked on two legs, some walked on many legs, some were lizard-like, some were just, you can imagine, uh, like, dinosaur-looking kind of creatures. But they were smart, they were intelligent. And they came up to Locus and they said, who are you? And he says, I'm bringing beings from another world here. I'm bringing beings from the third world. We need to escape. We need to, we need to be here. And they said, you're, the, you, you're here. Only the strong can be here. If you can survive our test, your people can come. He says, okay, whatever test you have. And so these beings grabbed the lightning bolt, and they threw it at Locus. Then they stabbed him. All, and the lightning bolt went all through his body. And it was like an arrow that kind of went through his body. And... They laugh. They say, you're, you're weak. Your people can't come here. But then he appeared again, and Locust said, see, I'm here. I'm not dead. What he ended up doing was shedding his skin, and they actually shot the lightning bolt into his, his dead skin. So he tricked those, those monsters. And so the people came into this world. The other animal, a lot of different animals from our creation stories came into this world. So they say these monstrous beings were already here. They said they were either created or they were the mishaps of creation. Some uh, religious text talks about the Nephilim. Some talk about uh, the fallen angels um, kind of mating with the human females, making monsters and giants. Some indigenous people talk about similar things to where the deities would uh, mate with the females or the males would mate with the female deities and monstrosities would come about. There's a lot of different kind of theories as to where they came about. But the biggest thing was they're wreaking havoc. They're eating and heroes of old, like Hercules, us, Knight, and Zanatobashishchene, there's a lot of different heroes and monster slayers of old that got rid of these beings and had to put their bodies away. Is Bigfoot part of this phenomenon? So Bigfoot, and to a lot of indigenous cultures, uh, if you were to ask, you like, hey, what is Bigfoot to you Indian and uh, Native American people? And if you ask someone, it's like, ah, he's my cousin. He's my uncle. <laughs> And that rings a lot of truth because to us indigenous people, um, Bigfoot is a clan of its own. It's its own type of people, just like how little people are. There are certain races of beings that are either um, half spirit, half human, or half spirit, half physical, or they're um, physical, but with a lot more kind of, I guess, magical or spiritual prowess to them to where they still live in this world. Um 
in, in nature, like you have the little people that live in the ravines or those uh, little people that live in the lava tubes of Hawaii. Um, they're all over the place. And just like to us, Navajo people, Bigfoot, they roam like the bears or the migrating animals. They roam along the Chusco Mountains. They roam around the White Mountains around here. They are respected. And so they are intelligent as well. So we always leave them offering every year. We acknowledge them. We let them kind of have their own space. And when we give them offering in return, they give us, like we have a basket of offering we give. And we do a ceremony, and then you just see kind of huge shadowy beings that come from a mist, and they take the basket, and then they, in turn, in the basket, and so they take the offering in the basket. They leave the herbs that it seems like only they know where these herbs grow. They know where these medicines are, and so they give us people that medicine. So there's always a, a good relationship with Bigfoot and their clan and their people. So it's not like a scary being that pop culture makes it out to be it, it's not necessarily scary it's more like respect it just like how you respect the bear and its environment its territory you respect the bigfoot and its territory because you don't provoke it it can get mean and it can get scary and just like if you were to piss off any other person out there and go into their land <laughs> you might you might get them a little pissed off but you you respect their territory and their land and they'll respect you so am I allowed to ask a question about um, one of your the members on your team that's no longer with us? Would that be okay? Yeah, go right ahead. What happened to him? So with him, uh, Pattaya, he grew up, uh, he was born a type 2 diabetic. And so he had been uh, fighting that his whole life. And um, he was actually one of the few that actually lived as long as he did with his, his condition. It was a very severe case of type 2 diabetes. And I grew up with him since uh, we were three years old, and uh, we used to play with, play with each other uh, with power wheels, and we'd race each other on bikes down the street. Um, we grew up together, we went to school together. Um, we were there for each other's weddings, each other's best man. Um, and it came to a point where he asked what I used to do. He's like, "What do you? I see you have these tattoos. I see you disappeared from high school for a few years, and you returned with tattoos, and you're just a big dude now. What happened?" And so, um, I told him who I was and what I did, and he didn't quite believe it at first. But then, um, and once I brought him along with me, he saw everything that was going on. He's like, "Wow, okay." So that's where he's like, "I want to learn a little bit. I, there's no way I'm going to learn everything, but teach me a little bit, so I'm not so naive." So. He became part of unearthing the supernatural. He was he was my brother. He was he wasn't necessarily Native American by blood, but he could he could herd sheep. He could uh, make fry bread. He could do everything that an indigenous person could. And he knew the ceremonies. He knew what to do when I would perform them. He was my brother, and um, he got sick here a few months ago, and he it was hitting him really bad. He ended up in the hospital a few times, and. Eventually, um, he called us up the day before he passed. And he says, I'm not doing too good. And we said, hey, man, you need to go to the hospital. Go to the hospital. Do what you have to do. Take care of yourself. He's like, all right, I'll go in the morning. Um, but right now, I'm just tired. I'm going to go to sleep. And I guess he um, he was up in the morning, um, but he never went to the hospital. And he ended up passing on that morning um, from, from his condition, unfortunately. Oh, I'm really sorry to hear that. Um, so let's yeah, talk about your book. We all in every in every video from here on, we're gonna mention him. Uh, we're gonna eventually establish uh, just everything that he was. He was a true embodiment of a warrior, of who he was. And so he's with us in spirit. He's with us when we go investigating, and we still expect to hear his voice come through the spirit box someday. And um, he's gonna be part of us. And so he he will always be Pataya. He will always be a member of our group. And his story will carry on. That's great. And I'm really sorry that that's happened to you guys. Let's talk about your book. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's been it's been a little tough. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Journeys of a Young Spirit. What is that about? So Journeys of a Young Spirit. It's a book that I've taken on um, to kind of talk about some of the stories that I've been told, some of the stories that I've been given, along with the songs and ceremonies, about my particular mountain in Flagstaff. Uh, to go to sleep, San Francisco Peaks over there. These particular stories is a coming-of-age uh, story of a young spirit 
who is not necessarily human yet. He's still half human, half spirit. And he's interacting in a world that hasn't been shaped to how like we see it today. The mountains weren't weren't where they are. The rivers weren't where they are yet. And things were still kind of still being shaped. Even the night sky, the time between night and day was still being discussed. The stars were still being placed. It was very early on in creation. And so he was learning how to become a guardian because he, he, he's, he was given a task. Like, you have to go and become a guardian. You have to be a caretaker of this mountain. And you're going to be given a spirit, and the spirit's going to kind of give you everything you need, teach you everything you, ha- you need to know. And so it's his journey of becoming that guardian. Everything he needs to know. He's going to go through war. He's going to go through combat. He's going to go through love. He's going to go through just coming of age. And it's an amazing book that I love that I'm going to continue to share. It's a four-part book. I just wrote part one of his life on how he learned to become a guardian and the spirits he interacted with. And from there, it's going to eventually branch off to other beings and deities. In the books, you're going to hear about those monster slayers, Nayat Nazan and Tobashish Chinin. And this actually happens after the monster wars, which is years of uh, combating these monsters and putting them away. Those monsters are put away now. Now it's time to set things in motion and put things in place for pure humans to come. Humans who are more human than spirit. It's their time to come and we have to set things up for them. That's kind of the premise of it. And it's, it's a fun book that... It's kind of difficult because I'm translating everything from those old languages, translating it into English, as well as trying to make it an enjoyable read for people to kind of put themselves in his shoes and to also kind of learn as and maybe parts of their life that they can kind of relate to how to come about being a warrior, how to come about taking care and confronting uh, problems in your life and how to go about that. I'm really excited to read this book. I just ordered it tonight, so it should be here. Awesome. Thank tomorrow, you. I think. <laughs> I'm real excited to read it, though, and I'll definitely promote it on my social media outlets and stuff. So what Appreciate are some it. Of I'll have to sign it, sign it when, you, when we see each other. <laughs> <laughs> oh, are you going to be at the um, – are you going to be at the Vulture Paracon, Vulture City Paracon? Yes. I'll be Definitely there. Definitely will. Awesome. Do, yes, so. I'll sign it there. <laughs> I'm going to try to get part two out by that time. Everyone hounds me for that part two. I'm trying my best. <laughs> I'm really busy. So. <laughs> so what are some of the things that you're involved in right now? Some upcoming projects and paracons and things like that. So right now, um, we are actually getting ready. Uh, we're actually co-hosting a Paracon in Orange County. This is um, the Orange County Paracon, OC Paracon. And it's actually, uh, we're co-hosting it with um, with uh, Henry San Miguel and uh, his group, 22 Creations. And it's the first Paracon in Orange County, um, California, Southern California area. We're hoping to bring a lot of different people around. And also just kind of showcase who we are as Indigenous paranormal investigators and just have a great time meeting people, having fun. Uh, Like you said, uh, Vulture City Paracon, we are definitely going to be there. Uh, Last year, we performed the opening ceremony there, and we caught a lot of people, caught some amazing evidence of a full body apparition while we're doing the ceremony. So that's an amazing um, Uh, Always an amazing time to have ceremony, help people out. Uh, Meeting a lot of different people. The Tennessee Wraith Chasers are going to be there. Jay Marie Yates, a lot of different. uh, Patty Negri, a lot of different celebrities are going to be there. It's going to be a great time. Uh, For other things, the Supernatural, we are working on pretty much Silver Silver Eagle Productions. Just working on some uh, little side projects that we're doing. Uh, Filming for season three. We're um, trying to bring the camera along with us on a lot more of our adventures. Uh, not necessarily ghostly related, but when we do offerings at sacred sites or when we um, perform ceremonies at certain places, we want to kind of bring the camera a little bit because a lot of the places we go to, gorgeous scenery, and the stories that are told are amazing stories that should be at least recorded and carried on and maintained uh, throughout the generations. So we have that going on. Um, other than that, just our normal lives. My brother is working. Uh, myself, um, I'm going to college at University of Arizona. 
uh, taking care of my wife and my son, and the other guys were just doing what we can uh, normally as well. Hero, you sound like a really busy man. I really appreciate you being on tonight. I appreciate you. Thank you for having me. This is, I love your questions. I love being able to, to answer questions that are really thought out and are really honest and genuine. I love it. Thank you so much. Thank you.